Good morning, everyone. On behalf of Citizens for Modern Transit, I'd like to welcome you to our latest Talking Transit event this month. Today, we will be discussing the Northside Southside Metrolink expansion project and specifically the four routes that are being considered for the North St. Louis County Community Connector. Thank you to all the CMT board members who have joined us this morning. And we do this every time, but it's really important for us as a small nonprofit to recognize our platinum and gold sponsors that allow us to host events like this and provide the information to the community. So I'd like to thank AARP in St. Louis, by state Development, the City of Belleville, the Realtor Association of Southwestern Illinois, the St. Clair County Transit District, Washington University in St. Louis, BJC Healthcare, Gonzalez Companies, Greater St. Louis Inc., HNTB, Missouri and Kansas Laborers District Council, and ULICO. Again, we wouldn't be able to do these events without their support, so thank you. And thank you to everyone who has joined us today. We're excited to see such a large turnout to discuss the future of transit and its impacts on the region on the region, especially from the job access perspective for North City and North County. There really is a lot going on right now with regards to public transit in the region. There is construction underway in Illinois on the expansion of Metrolink to the Mid-America St. Louis Airport with access to new job centers like the recently opened Boeing facility. We have also this month been focusing on security updates to the system and the impact of the quarterly service changes on our riders today. But now let's take a look ahead. Where would you like to see your transit stop in the future? What are the possibilities for light rail in St. Louis city and county? The timeline and the impact on everyday riders, employers and visitors. So let's get started. First, I'd like to welcome our panel this morning. And that includes Kristen Lucan. She's the project manager from AECOM on the Northside Southside project, the CEO of Employment Connection St. Louis, Sal Martinez, the director of transportation planning, Marcy Maestrick from the East West Gateway Council of Governments, and by state development president and CEO, Talby Roach. Thank you all for joining us this morning. We get some waves. We know there is a lot going on right now through the work of AECOM with the potential expansion of light rail in the city and the county. And today we're hoping to dig just a little bit deeper. What are the possibilities? How do we ensure that St. Louis has a successful project? And what would the impact of, these pro of this project, we like to say one project, not multiple projects, of this project be to the St. Louis region? So please make sure to place your questions in the chat box or in the Q&A, and I will get to them as soon as possible. But let's start by allowing our panelists to provide a five minute intro, and then we're gonna turn to question and answers. We know that there are a lot of questions right now in the community, and we wanna make sure that we provide that forum to have them answered. So to start, we're gonna invite Kristen, the project manager, to start with you. As the consulting firm studying the various routes and the transit stop alternatives, can you lay the groundwork for us with regards to where your, what your work entails on these studies and the technical factors that are guiding the analysis? Absolutely, thank you, Kim, I appreciate it. All right, so I'll give you a little bit of the background on what we're studying in North St. Louis County. So you can see here the area in yellow um, indicates the, the North Estill County Community Connector Study Area. Um, so when we look at this area overall, we see really high um, levels of existing transit rider, um, transit riders, um, zero car households, um, low income households, all the, the people that you would expect um, might really benefit from a transit extension into North County. So that is the reason that, that study area was selected. Um, as we move into um, this phase of the, of the alternatives analysis, you can see here the four um, lines that we've been studying to date. Um, so South Florissant Road, past Umzel, down Natural Bridge, each of these feature a connection to the proposed city north side, south side alignment on Jefferson Avenue. Um, the purple alignment on West Florissant Road to Goodfellow, uh, the green alignment on Halls Ferry Road to Lucas and Hunt, and then the pink alignment on Halls Ferry Road to Jennings Stations, each 
of these then connecting in at that natural bridge area. Kristen, at I'm going to stop you for one mm -hmm. second because the slides aren't advancing. So did you want um, to advance those or would you like Travis to advance those? We're getting lots of comments. Oh, got it. Let me see here. I think this is a dual screen issue. Can you see them now? No. Okay. Yeah, I guess then Travis, um, I am on, I'll be on slide three for a minute and then slide four in what I sent you. Um, sure, I'll uh, pull those up just a sec. Thank there you. we go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Travis. Um, yeah, so how we um, develop these alignments, essentially these are um, derived from, um, sorry, now I'm not seeing my own slides. Um, these are derived from, essentially a combination of things, equity and demographic factors were a key part, um, as well as looking at existing bus ridership and rail compatible alignments. And then also thinking about net network transfer opportunities. So you can see the brown line features uh, a connection into the red line there at the Umsel North Station. The other three alternatives feature a connection to the North County Transit Center up there at uh, 270. So that's where these lines come from. And where we're at right now um, is refining which of these alignments or a combination of alignments makes the best option for North County. Um, and so what we've been going through is looking at our public feedback from our recent um, survey and open house events, uh, looking a little bit more specifically at some design requirements for a light rail and how that impacts each of these corridors. Um, thinking about our rough cost estimates and ridership forecasting um, to see, you know, how these perform. So on the next slide, uh, you will see kind of some of those demographic um, comparisons that I just mentioned. So um, really, um, each alignment has different um, populations that it's serving, but you can see overall, each of these is doing really well. When we think about the percent of people who already use transit, um, who are existing Metro customers riding the bus every day who could benefit from the improved travel times from that increased reliability, um, we're over 10% along each of these alignments and 11% on a um, on the, the three um, that go up to the, the transfer center there. So that is over five times greater than the rest of the county. So really indicating that all four of these are pretty strong corridors. Um, on the next slide, you can see how well those demographics fit with some of those project goals. Um, so the first being providing more choices to those with limited options. Um, and so you can see again on the red map, um, percent of households without a vehicle and the uh, teal map, the existing um, people who are using transit every day to get to work. So those darkest colors, um, reflect pretty high concentrations of those key populations. Um, on slide six, uh, looking at how well demographics match our, our other key project goal, which is investing in historically underserved or marginalized neighborhoods. So the green showing um, percent minority and the blue map featuring um, population below poverty. So again, you can see pretty strong um, need throughout these corridors. And why that goal is important is we're looking not just at providing transit to the community, but this is also a huge investment. And so we want to make sure that that investment and all the things that come with it um, support the community at, at a broader level. So when you think about those sidewalk enhancements, lighting around stations, uh, those things that benefit the community, the increased activity um, at station areas that can drive economic development, all of that's um, an important factor to this analysis as well. Um, and so you can see on slide seven, uh, some of those features that I just mentioned um, associated with a typical light rail design, pedestrian enhancements. Um, you can see that the curb kind of separates traffic from the right of way. This is what is providing that really um, reliable and higher speed travel time associated with the rail project compared to a typical bus, which could get um, stuck in traffic and have that same kind of variability that you would see with a car. On slide eight, you can see a few examples of other projects around the nation um, utilizing similar technology. So uh, Minneapolis, LA Metro, Houston, Phoenix, these are some, um, some examples of how this you know, looks when you take it from vision to reality. 
Um, and then on slide nine, just kind of looking at a couple of the elements that are really important to our decision making in the county. So I mentioned we're looking at demographics, uh, public feedback, and then the, the detail of the design and how that works within these four corridors. So one key consideration is incline. Typically, we like to identify a corridor for rail that is um, going to be at about a 6% slope or less, and that has to do with the traction power. Um, and more, even more importantly, at station areas, because you want that level boarding, ADA compliance, people can wheel or push their strollers straight onto, um, onto the train without, you know, bumping or jarring. And so that flat topography at station areas is really important. Um, similarly, for curvature, uh, the light rail can make turns. They're not sharp 90 degree angles, but you can kind of see at the top about how those um, turns happen through the, the street right of way. Um, but thinking about station placement, we need to identify areas that are on um, a straight line. And again, that's so that that level boarding um, at the platform, you know, that there's no buckling or gaps between um, the vehicle and the, the platform itself. Um, on slide 10, uh, you can kind of see some of the engineering challenges that we've been um, looking at and assessing as a team. So when we think about each of these four corridors, some areas are a bit narrower than others. Um, some areas are a bit more steep and hilly. Um, there are places where there's some curvature or other tight spots. Um, so these are all the things that we're kind of folding into our, our planning level cost estimate to give us a good idea of um, how easy or challenging each of these corridors might be for light rail. Now, um, nothing is impossible, but any time you have those um, kind of significant design challenges that you need to work through, it tends to increase the cost. So that's part of um, what's factoring into the decision making here as well. Um, let's see on slide 11, just summarizing our public outreach. We've talked to a ton of people so far. Um, over 35 stakeholder groups and elected official briefings. Vector's been out on the street. Um, they did that to distribute the survey as well as promote the project. Um, and we wound up with um, almost 2,400 online survey responses um, with over 40% of that coming from residents of the county. And what we saw, and this is the last slide that I wanna highlight, um, what we saw with that is really a, a pretty good pairing between the preferred stations that people are, are looking at and the stations that we modeled as part of our, um, you know, service planning um, kind of setup and trying to figure out travel times and things like that. So some of our initial assumptions are matching pretty well with what, um, what we're hearing from the public. But this is where we're really at with our public um, response and kind of seeing how can we you know, put together the pieces of this and I and seeing all these um, preferred station areas and thinking about those design challenges, how can we put together um, a preferred alignment in a way that best um, reflects the, the needs of the community and, um, you know, our, you know, kind of design um, challenges that we need to, that we need to work around. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to the next speaker, which I just told me. Thank you, Kristen, for that, for laying the groundwork for us. And I think there's going to be a lot of questions as we move forward through this conversation. So let's move to Talby Roach, the president and CEO of Bi State Development, because this is a two part project. And Talby and has been leading the charge on behalf of the Bi State Development Agency on the city portion of this project. So, Talby, can you? provide us an update of where we are on the city portion and how that project ties into this regional infrastructure plan. That's great. Good morning, everybody. And th thanks, everybody, for attending. And thanks, Kristen, for that, that good primer. So yes, I'd love to, although we're talking about separate projects from city and county, I like to think of this as a regional uh, project that's including both aspects because ultimately both alignments should be feeding each other in ridership and capacity and accessing the important neighborhoods um, that will allow us to build momentum. You know, let's remember about how we've been able to develop light rail in St. Louis. And yes, I would agree, sometimes we've stubbed our toe and been a little slow, but most of the time, that slowness has been that we haven't had adequate buy-in from the community, that there hasn't been good momentum. 
And I know it's a little frustrating to see all these multiple routes and a lot of meetings and so on, but that's how we do that. We have to reach out to the community and be sure that we are building an alignment that makes sense. And that certainly that makes is, is the case with the county. But in the city where we, we have moved forward with the Jefferson Corridor as the alignment, there is a lot of momentum towards the simplicity of a bold north-south movement. Just from a transportation standpoint, there's a need for that. We're seeing that with the parallel bus routes and the ridership that we see. Also, uh, look, in order to make these uh, light rail lines successful, we need to have rooftops near them. And I, I don't really care or prescient whether those roof, rooftops are houses or job opportunity. If we want to look at using this as essentially a catalyst to the future of the city, both in the city and county, these should be drivers of development, whether that's drivers of job access or realizing unfulfilled promises to impacted neighborhoods of color. Um, and certainly the city alignment does that. Um, uh, significantly as we move up to the north in Jefferson. Obviously, access to NGA, and that is a realized promise in the, in the federal investment, and we certainly want to see that. I also want to make the point that I've been in Washington, D.C., and we have had preliminary discussions about both of um, the city alignment and the possibility of the, of the county alignments, they were really well received, especially from our partners at FTA. And that's fundamentally behind the, the, the demographics that we show. Significant access to areas of poverty or areas of either one, one car or zero car, car households. These are key drivers for us to score well so that we can garner federal money. Um, and so those are really important aspects as we as we think about how to unify our effort so that we can take these projects to Washington, D.C. and get them funded and ultimately build something that's successful. Great. Thank you, Talby, and thank you for joining us this morning. So now let's hear from Marcy Maestrick. Marcy is the Director of Transportation Planning for the Metropolitan Planning Organization, East-West Gateway Council of Governments. So Marcy, I know that East West Gateway works a lot within the federal funding process. So can you describe what the region can expect from the federal funding process for a project of this scale? Sure, thank you, Kim. Um, thanks for giving me the most riveting piece of this whole uh, conversation. I think, I think yeah. you can keep it riveting, though, Marcy. All right. um, I put a few slides together just because it's a lot of words and then for a lot of people, I think it'll be new information. So I thought it'd be easier to see it. So. Um, Go ahead and advance to the next one, Travis. Um, so there are three funding programs within the Capital Investment Grants Program, um, and they are the New Starts Program, which is fixed guideway, newer extension, um, a capital cost estimate of over $400 million, and a federal request of over $150 million. Small Starts, which is a smaller version of that program, and then Core Capacity, which is more for projects located in an established and proven corridor. Um, for this particular project, we'll likely be um, pursuing New Starts funding. Next slide. So when you get into the New Starts process, there are three stages to that. There's project development, engineering, and construction. Next slide, please. Um, under project development, um, the things that have to be completed within a two-year time frame are selection of a locally preferred alternative and the adoption into the region's long-range plan of that. Um, that locally preferred alternative. Um, all of the environmental work under NEPA has to be finished, the National Environmental Protection Act, um, and a final decision from FTA on that work has to be obtained. Um, you have to develop sufficient information for the Federal Transit Administration to evaluate and rate your project to determine whether or not you can um, enter into the next phase you need to obtain a commitment of at least 30% of your local funding sources and complete at least 30% of the design and engineering. Um, all of these items, again, must be completed within two years um, once a project enters into the project development stage. Next slide. So at the at kind of at the end of that, or at some point during that project development phase, you need to obtain a rating from FTA. And this is just a glimpse of the criteria that they use. 
it's a very objective criteria. There's not a whole lot of room in that for, um, for subjectivity. So it's, it's all based on particular data and there are parameters for each rating um, and projects have to receive at least uh, an overall rating of medium in order to proceed into the engineering stage. Now, I will say, looking at the FTA dashboard, there is a project in there right now that doesn't have a medium. It has a medium low. So um, there might be a little bit of room there. Um, but overall, 50% of your rating comes from project justification, and 50% comes from local financial commitment. And uh, you can kind of look at how those are all broken down on this graphic. Next slide, please. So once, uh, once FTA has given the project a rating um, and agrees that it can move forward, it enters the engineering phase. Um, in this phase, the project is reviewed by FTA for reasonableness. Um, the federal funding request is locked in, so it's important to have a really good estimate at this phase. Um, FTA would like you to see project sponsors obtain a commitment of at least 50% of their local funding and complete all third party agreements. That would be things like oh, railroad cooperation agreements. Um, in this case, because this is running along MoDOT right of way, there would be agreements signed with MoDOT, things like that. Um, demonstrate progress toward meeting their transit asset management plan uh, that Metro has and their and meeting their state of good repair tar targets. And then um, again, just meeting those readiness requirements related to technical capacity, staffing, oversight. Um, FTA just wants to make sure that the project sponsor has the ability to operate and to build and operate the project. Next slide, please. So once a project has come through engineering, um, then you're eligible to enter into construction, assuming that you're still at that medium or higher ra um, rating because they do reevaluate that rating at this point. Um, so in order to advance into construction, a project has to be included in the annual report on funding recommendations, which is an accompaniment to the president's budget each year. And it depends on that rating that you receive, the av availability of program funds. And uh, you know there, there is some pretty hefty competition for these funds at the national level. Um, also that consideration of project readiness, they're looking for a reliable project scope, cost and schedule, and to make sure that you've got at least 50% of your local funding commitment lined up. Um, they look over project man management plans to ensure that the sponsor has the capacity and the capability to deliver the project. Metro has a proven past and has been able to do that multiple times. And they will review and approve um, at high, high levels, the FTA executive leadership, USDOT leadership, and then others within FTA review the project at this point before, um, before signing that construction agreement. Um, next slide. I think that's about all I have. But oh, I typically a project just because people always want to know how long it takes and the pace of public money moves much slower than most people um, like. But in general, a project of this size, you could expect to take seven to 10 years. There are things I know that Metro has been talking about to try to make things move a little quicker and I'll just see what Talby or Kristen have to say about that. But I think that's all I have for now. Thank you. Thank you, Marcy, for laying the groundwork for the funding part of this, which is a critical component to moving this project forward in the region. We really appreciate that riveting primer on what it is to move that forward. So now, now let's welcome Sal Martinez with Employment Connection St. Louis. We wanted to hear from a stakeholder in the region, in this area where we're talking about Metrolink expansion. Sal, you're on the ground in North St. Louis County, and you, we're hoping you will share how the county portion of the Metrolink expansion and the city portion as well will impact communities in the North St. Louis extension area. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Kim and Travis and the uh, CMT team for giving me an opportunity uh, to be a part of this great uh, event today. Uh, Employment Connections serves the entire city of St. Louis and St. Louis County, so we're on the ground in uh, both geographies. Uh, our end game is to put our clients in a position to be uh, self-sufficient, 
uh, Travis, you can uh, uh, move forward with the slides as you see fit. Um, again, self-sufficiency is our end game. We do not want to put our clients in a position where they don't have to depend on government support. Uh, we know that uh, priorities change with new administrations and what have you. And so we want to put our clients in a position where they can bet on themselves. Next slide, Travis. Uh, so we were founded in 1977. So we've been around for over four decades. Uh, as I mentioned, we serve the city, the county, actually we uh, serve St. Clair County as well. About 50% of our clients uh, traditionally are justice involved, meaning that they've made a mistake or two. None of us are perfect. Uh, and we have evolved to a place where we don't turn any client away who needs our services. Next slide. Again, I mentioned our, our about 50% of our clients just involved. We don't turn anybody uh, away, single mothers, individuals that are unemployed, underemployed, uh, or what have you. If uh, client, if, if individuals uh, work up the courage and faith to walk in our doors, we're going to do everything we can to serve them and put them again on that path to self-sufficiency. Next slide. Uh, again, we talked about our end game. Uh, we serve uh, over 2,000 clients uh, per year from all walks of life. Uh, transportation, next slide. Transportation is a, a big, big issue uh, for many of our clients. As I mentioned, obviously, most of our clients are either unemployed or underemployed. So public transportation uh, is a key for them. We do provide some level of transportation uh, assistance with uh, free uh, bus passes, uh, Metrolink tickets. Uh, we provide assistance with ride sharing uh, opportunities, but public transportation uh, is a key, key part uh, of what our clients need in order to be successful. We can give them the skills. We can uh, introduce them to employers, but obviously if they don't have a way to uh, travel uh, to take advantage of those employment opportunities, that is a big, big problem. Next slide. So what you see here are just some of our programs. Uh, again, we consider ourselves a an organization that provides a number of wraparound services, including job training and placement. Uh, we provide housing assistance. We provide both eviction uh, prevention assistance uh, to keep our clients housed. And we also provide rapid rehousing assistance for our clients who are unfortunately unhoused when they engage the organization. We provide free mental behavioral counseling for our uh, clients as well. Uh, next slide, we also operate uh, multiple violence prevention uh, sites in the city of St. Louis. Uh, recently, I've been in uh, conversations with County uh, Chairperson Shalonda Webb uh, and Councilwoman uh, Rita Days about uh, potentially bringing some of our uh, violence prevention uh, services to St. Louis County. We would be very excited uh, to do that. So um, as, uh, as Toby said, uh, transportation is very key, but we also want to do what we can to increase the number of rooftops uh, in North City and North County. Uh, we're currently in partnership with Bywater Development Group, one to uh, renovate a existing senior development in North St. Louis City, and we're also uh, pursuing the development of a, a TOD uh, near 70 uh, in Hanley. Um, I was on the uh, phone earlier this week uh, with a few employers uh, located in West County, and they were interested in what we could do to um, send them in with some uh, credible employees to interview. And when I asked them about the uh, public transportation that was available to their location, they said, well, there's not much. And so that's going to be a problem. Uh, they have great opportunities for individuals who are justice involved, or perhaps don't have a lot of experience in the workplace. But again, if there isn't public transportation available to them, we can not assist them. And even worse for us, we can not assist the clients who are dreaming about becoming self-sufficient. So I will stop it there. Thank you. Thank you, Silent. And thank you for giving us a little bit of background and the perspective you're coming from as we continue further on this conversation. So thank you to all of our panelists. I think we've laid the groundwork really well on this conversation about North Side, South Side. So now let's jump into question and answers. And please, as a reminder, make sure you place your question and answers in the chat box or the Q&A, and I will get to them as quickly as possible. So first question out the gate, Kristen, I think this is directed to you and your partner in crime, Ben Tomhave, who is a transportation planner with um, your firm as well. 
And Marcy touched on it a little bit in her presentation, but how does this project look from a possible federal funding perspective compared to other projects that you have both worked on across the country? Right, thanks. Um, so I think that that question is, is a good one. It's that we're still pulling together capital costs at this point for this project. So a lot of the financial readiness, which is 50% of that score is gonna be dependent on that revenue and cost side, which we're just not ready to answer yet. Um, from a you know, ridership and land use perspective, I think the, the land use numbers are looking pretty good. If, if we look at um, a couple of the indicators there, the affordable housing density, um, as well as, um, and, you know, just population density and, and things like that, I think are um, pretty highly indicative of, of a good area. Um, the ridership statistics, we're still working through that as well. So um, I think, again, you know, just the volume of um, people who are currently using Metro, people um, who don't have access to a vehicle, um, speaks pretty highly of the, the potential of this corridor. Um, we are kind of looking at ways to, you know, identify those hot spots and those key station areas. And one thing that our team is doing right now, um, as we kind of look at those four alignment options and where we really are, are soliciting a lot of feedback, is are there ways to, um, to kind of mix and match the best alternatives together to have a project that has the best chance of being competitive for that federal funding, um, as well as, you know, uh, addressing as many of those station preferences as we're seeing from the community. So I think, you know, we're not necessarily tied into picking one of those four, um, but looking at selecting kind of the best pieces of all of them. Okay, and just to piggyback on that question, and, and that, and I, and we're getting some comments in the, in the chat box as well. So you're saying, Kristen, that we are, we aren't married to picking one of those four routes in the county portion of this project. It could actually be a merge of one or two of those corridors. And one of the questions we have received is, why not connect directly to the Forest Park Community College? Would there be a strong pedestrian link between a station on? West Florissant in the college as part of the project. And I don't, I'm not sure that they mean Forest Park Community College. I think they mean Florissant um, Valley, Valley Community yeah. College location. So um, so if you could just confirm for us, because I, I think a lot of people think you have to pick one of these routes and that's it. It's it's a done deal. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, that's a great point. So yes, we're not necessarily, um, having to pick a single one of these. These four were chosen as preliminary alternatives to study um, just based on very rough planning factors. And so now that we're getting some of our evaluation back, we're getting our public feedback back, um, part of what we'd really like to do is to sift through that and, and identify um, you know, a single corridor to move forward and in, into the next phase that makes the most sense for the, the, for the community, whether it looks exactly like one of those four or not. And I think, um, you know, based on the station preferences, yes, we had one um, alignment option. They got pretty close to Flow Valley over there. Um, and, you know, certainly something like that could be pieced together with some of those other corridors. It doesn't necessarily have to turn at the locations we identified turning movements. Um, yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. So Marcy, let's let's turn to you and going back to your presentation, can you give us a little info on what project scored medium low and why is that one moving forward in your opinion? But also when we're talking about a project of this size, size and scope, in your in the history of East West Gateway and, and the projects you have worked on, what does it look like for a possible build out of a project like this if if funding was secured? Schedule wise, is that what you're asking? Yes. Okay. Um, so as far as the medium low project, I don't know a lot about it. It was, uh, it's a streetcar project in LA. It's small start, so it's a much lower ask um, and much lower funding amount, but um, probably be good for us to check that out to see what their circumstances were. So good idea, Kim. Um, and as far as the build out, I mean, generally you can figure, you know, I talked about how project development phase, you're limited to two years when you're in that phase. 
Um, it's important to do enough work before going into project development that you know you can finish all of the work that has to be done in that two year time frame. So that's always a balance that you try to walk where you do just enough so that you can get your work done in two years because you're not getting reimbursed for any of the cost before you get into project development. Um, so two years for that, and then you just assume two to three years generally for engineering and for construction. Um, and you know, if you've got more money to throw at it, you can probably get things to move quicker, but that's just a general time frame is about 70, 10 years seven to 10 years overall until your project is up, up and operating in revenue service. Great, thank you. So Toby, let's, let's go back to uh, your comments. And you know, one of the things that's really important to Citizens for Modern Transit is when we talk about public transit, we have to talk about it as regional infrastructure. It's a critical component of our transportation system. And you know, we talk about how Metrolink spans city county boundaries, it's, it spans two states. So when you look at this application for federal funding, Will it be critical to include both the city and the county portion to ensure that ridership numbers and development opportunities are across the corridor? And will this be important for the scoring metrics of this? So um, just by the nature of where some of the tax revenue is being collected, we have done projections on both projects separately. And what I can tell you and this is prior to, of course, AECOM coming up with their full cost estimates, but on a very generous basis, both projects independently work financially. We can make them work, okay? Um, and of course, you need to look at that very quickly because of course, we're, we're generating tax revenue right now and putting aside capital associated with both these projects. But we're in the midst of the process and AECOM needs to complete the full um, application and be sure that the engineer's estimates are in there, ridership estimates and so on. But I, I can tell you with full confidence that both projects work if they were to be independent. However, they're gonna score better when they're thought of together. Obviously the, the county's demographics happen to be a little bit stronger right now um, because um, there's, there's less divestiture in the, in the county corridor as a general um, concept. Um, however, we have a city to rebuild in North City. Um, and so a lot of these considerations do have to be taken into context when we fight for these dollars politically. One of, one of the very important aspects of this is that not only how we score technically, but then what are the provisions with developing, you know, a tier two Midwestern city that is trying to change its economic future. And one of that is in, in, in conjunction with how the current administration sees this under the Justice 40 initiative. In other words, how do we move into these areas where, you know, we need to rebuild a city and, and, and restart the economics. And so that means that there's, there is some scoring associated with those aspects that we do expect to do very, very well. That will help us. And I do expect both projects to score in the medium to medium low. Um, but I think that the future from both projects is, is much stronger associated with the concepts of rebuilding both the city and county. So definitely there is provisions for that. And FTA has said publicly that they are going to relook at some of the ridership scoring on a post-pandemic basis for one. And for two, there's new directives as far as staggering or bundling projects. So for instance, a phase one being the city project and then a, and then a bundle application being put in with uh, a, a, a phase two in the county. Um, but a lot of that is very, very preliminary, and those are some things that have to be looked at. And of course, those are the conversations I have when I go to our legislative partners in DC. And when I've done that, I've really universally been um, greeted positively, both from Democrats and Republicans from both sides of the state. So part of this um, is working a unified legislative strategy to be sure that we're putting the pressure on so that we have our best chance at getting these projects funded. 
And I think um, there is a scenario within a phased approach, staggered or bundled, that both projects can be very, very successful. Thank you, Toby. So Sal, let's turn to you on a question here this morning. So you talked a little bit about how transportation is a transportation access is a critical link for your clients on a daily basis, access to jobs and other opportunities. And you know, we know you're partnering with Bywater Development on a possible development at North Hanley. But what do you think the impact would be on an expansion of light rail to North City and North County on actually bringing in new rooftops to those areas from, from your work with Bywater and your work in the communities? Do you think that will have an impact? What areas do you think it would be most impactful? What are your thoughts on, on, on that? Sure. I, I think it would be a game changer. Um, it's an amenity that uh, has been missing. Uh, in, especially in North City uh, and in uh, certain uh, municipalities, certainly in, in North County. Uh, this is something that the community has asked for for many, many years. I've been a part of many uh, community development planning efforts over the years, whether it was uh, for uh, the uh, preservation square development uh, off the of Cass uh, and between 20th and uh, 13th Street. Uh, community uh, redevelopment efforts in Jeff Vanderloo. I've been a part of Project Connect as part of the growth of, of NGA, uh, et cetera. And having access to uh, quality, uh, affordable public transportation uh, has been something that has come up in all of those uh, sessions. Um, I think as it relates to uh, working to keep the uh, community uh, engage in this, in this um, planning and impl uh, implementation effort. I think we need to commit to meet people where they are, uh, show up at community meetings, uh, go into local churches, um, recruit uh, people of influence, the elected officials and other community leaders, get them on board and, and help to build that broad base of community-based support uh, that is very, very needed. Uh, I will tell you that many people in these communities uh, feel that they have been forgotten about, that uh, opportunities for development uh, have passed them over. And so we need to uh, show the community that this is serious, that this is about improving uh, their lives, their children's lives, their, their, their neighbors' lives, uh, et cetera. So again, this would be a game changer. I'm very excited to be a part of this conversation because it's been something that the community has asked for, has pleaded for, for many, many years. Thank you, Sal. And so piggybacking on what Sal had to say, Kristen, what does community engagement look like? What is the time frame for people to weigh in or people to invite you and Vector to come to their community group? meet them where they're at. What does that time frame look like for any other potential community engagement leading up to a, a route selection in the North St. Louis County area? Yeah, um, so we've been out um, throughout the community quite a bit, meeting with um, a lot of different neighborhood groups and um, community stakeholder groups. Um, and I think, it, like I mentioned, Vector's been out um, with their street team, just going door to door. Uh, throughout the study area to make sure folks are aware of, of what's going on. Um, so I think we've had some pretty good um, turnout at, through our surveys and, um, you know, on, to our website. So really successful there, but that's, you know, certainly not the end of, of community outreach. So if, um, you know, if you do represent a group that, that you'd like us to come talk to, please do reach out to Vector. Um, the study is not over yet. So um, we're still we're still taking those engagements. Um, you know, I was out at a, a couple of things earlier this week, so and we're here today. So uh, certainly still time to do that. Um, I would anticipate as the project moves forward that there will continue to be robust uh, public engagement throughout each stage of this. So as you look at some of the design uh, kind of pre-project development is what it's usually called, advancing your design enough to to refine your corridor a bit before you take it into the federal process. There's a outreach component at that phase. Um, and then you'll generally have a very um, significant public outreach component throughout project development as part of your um, Environmental Protection Act requirements, um, making sure that 
all community issues are, are being adequately addressed um, is part of is a big part of that um, environmental review, things like that, and then throughout uh, final design. Okay, great. So is there a website, Kristen, for people who are on this webinar today that they can access additional information or weigh in by email or find out about any other public meetings coming up? Yeah, thank you for asking that. Um, GrowingMetroLink.com is the project website, and there is a um, kind of a, a chat box there to leave comments now that our survey has has closed, but there's still an opportunity to leave comments on the project through that chat box. Great. So um, a question for you before we move on to some of these other questions in the chat box, this is this kind of piggybacks on the conversation of weighing in on the on the four choices within the the North St. Louis County Community Connector area. Um, is there is there a is there a lead? Is there a one route that's winning over the other four? Or what are some of the challenges and opportunities associated with each of those four routes? Or even more in depth, is there a certain area that your survey results are showing that must be connected, must be ser provided service through this project that's rising to the top? Yeah, I'm gonna try to share my screen again so y'all can see the lines as I talk about them. Hopefully this um, works this time. And, and Travis can always help us. He's our IT okay. guru. I, I, think I, I think I'm able to Perfect. do it as long as I'm not projecting. You can see the map here, right? Yeah. So um, yeah, what I would say is that based on, especially for the county alignments, um, based on our survey feedback, um, you know, there, the, the top two routes um, looked like they were the purple on West Florissant and then the brown on North Florissant Road um, and Florissant Ave. However, um, when you dig into that a little bit deeper, I would say all four of these corridors are, the, the differences there are not super strong. It, it depends on whether you're looking at people who have strong preferences for things versus people who like, but maybe, you know, it's not as strong because we have a rating scale there. So um, each of these quarters has some merits and I think has good public support. It's um, it's a fairly close um, lead is what I would say. So that is part of the reason that we are kind of looking at, um, you know, trying to identify the best uh, pieces of each of these corridors in light of that station area feedback and the design challenges. And so that's um, the station area feedback you can kind of see here. Obviously, uh, North County Transit Center is a big hub because that allows folks um, to connect into all those bus routes that serve areas north of 270. Um, so providing access to further North County um, the ability to do that is really bolstered by connecting into that transit center there. Um, you can also see a, a pretty strong um, preference for stations within uh, the, the community of Ferguson, and then as well as connecting into the red line here um, at UMSL. Uh, and then there's you know some other hot spots that we, we had kind of noted, some shopping centers and things where we had um, multiple alignments that were you know attempting to serve similar areas, and you can see those popping as well. So, um, yep. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you, Kristen. So, Talby, question for you. How, how will this, the proposed Jefferson alignment coming out of the city connect into the current red and blue lines? What will that connection point be and, and what will that look like? Sure, so, so a very important aspect of all transit systems are obviously you know transfer stations. This is a common uh, way to move between systems if you're in systems in other parts of the of the country or even the world it's not uncommon to see that so one of the absolute key aspects is to build a um, transfer station to the red and blue line from the north side south side jefferson alignment um, really right at about ewing okay ewing avenue which is immediately to the south of market street okay um, and there's a good opportunity. We have a maintenance facility at that location. Um, I wish there was not uh, so much elevation difference. It would be way easier, but 
you know, that's why you get really top flight engineers like AECOM and HNTB. You need, you need these folks to try to work out these details, but it's not unusual at all. And, and what that means is that when you have that good connection between these uh, different lines, it means it's just that the movement throughout the city will be easier. Um, when we make a fundamentally grid system across our uh, region, it, it just is inherently more efficient. And that does require some transfer. So as soon as, as when we make those transfers as seamless as possible, moving from one train to the next, um, uh, that will be a major part of the investment of the north side, south side at Jefferson Avenue, immediately to the south of Market Street there. Great. Thank you, Toby. We did just have a question about um, the secure platform plan. So will all the safe platforms be safe? Will all the, the new infrastructure be completed before talking, before moving this project forward? Um, is there a timing on that project that you want to provide our, our participants with, with regard to the secure platform plan? Mm -hmm. So the, so the timing on the projects are not necessarily linked. I mean, one does not affect the other. But what I can tell you is that the concepts of secure platform plan are embedded directly into the design con concepts of north side, south side, um, both in Jefferson alignment and in the county alignment. And as a matter of fact, in the uh, primary management consultant um, uh contract that was recently let to HNTB, uh, one of the major design elements was HNTB's recognition that that's a design paradigm that we want to move forward on. Really intelligent um, idea of trying to be sure that we are looking at a gated system that has some fundamental security elements, um, and that'll help us move forward on this. So an SPP security concept is very much part of the expansion of Metrolink. Um, and although uh, they are separate as far as timing is concerned, and SPP is is moving quite well right now. Great. Okay, great. So um, we have a question. Um, reliable transit requires schedules that work for riders. Are the employers who need workers operating a second shift? Will there be service? What will be the service hours of this project? They may be referring to the current system, but how how will we tackle that? What will the connecting bus system look like into this extension if it happens? Yeah, so the connecting bus system is 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 critical to a, an a an operating transit system. Today and in the future, complementary bus system. And remember, uh, bus ridership still accounts for between 60 and 70 percent of our overall ridership. And, and I don't expect that to change even with development of this light rail system. They need to work complementary so that um, the bus system is feeding the, the light rail system and, and so forth. So that's how transit fundamentally works because we need to, to do uh, build these access points wherever we can. Now, also within the fundamental concept of what is our biggest difficulty right now as far as transit is concerned, and not just here, but across the country, it is with labor availability. Um, we are having trouble and please, if you know anybody who's looking for work right now, we, we need operators, frontline operators, and that is affecting some of our fundamental service profiles. It's not money, okay? I'm not, I do not need more operating money right now. It is more in labor availability. And so that does affect some of the, of the hours of service that we are able to offer. It is also true that fundamentally, as far as the hours that you put out and capacity, that light rail is a little bit more efficient from a labor standpoint. So we're able to put more hours out on the street of transit service from a train, okay? But that doesn't mean that it, it is not complemented and very much integrated with an active bus system. They cannot operate independently the way we have designed our system, and we need to continue to think that uh, paradigm. Great, thank you. So um, Kristen, when we look to the future, it's kind of what we're doing today, 
what is the time frame or the goal in having the selection of the alignment for the St. Louis County Community Connection Connector? I think I got that right. Yeah, so um, we're looking at, our, our initial schedule is looking um, at August. I think at this point, um, there are a few uh, design details kind of still on the table, and especially because the operating cost models and the ridership models for the county are kind of built on top of um, operating and, and engineering detail assumptions for the, the city alignment because they're operating as a, um, a cohesive network there um, that we are looking at probably more early fall um, to have everything buttoned up, but pretty pretty quickly here. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay. So, so what what do you what do all of you need from the participants on this call and the and the general public at large in the St. Louis community who want to ensure that we see um, a bright future for transit in the community? What do they need to do? Yeah, I think um, is that for all, I think all our panelists should weigh in on this yeah. one. But for this immediate study um, for the the North County. Uh, Community Connector Alternatives, please, you know, go to the project website, leave your feedback, especially if you've got strong preferences on corridors, um, station areas, things like that. Um, we are still working through that, that detail, um, you know, especially in light of kind of what you've heard here today. Uh, let us know what you think so that we can identify the project that's going to, you know, really meet everybody's needs as, as good as possible. If you've got creative ideas, love to hear them. Um, but then, yeah, just moving forward, kind of continue to monitor and, and support the project. Okay. Anyone else want to weigh in on that question? Sure, I'll, uh, I, I will. <laughs> so, Marcy, I saw that your microphone came on as well. So you will get a chance, I promise. I promise, Marcy, I'll try to be quick. So what, what is the difference between today or four years ago? And that is ownership by the community and what they want. Now, I'm not saying that we can, we can uh, get to everybody's needs, but right now we're creating a system through our, our help from both the city, county, and of course, by the consultants to figure out where we want our future to be and own that future. One of the things that we absolutely have to do is be sure that, okay, I get it, that makes sense. We can't be all things to all people, there has to be some compromise, um, but we definitely need to hear those voices. And I'm excited right now because, look, we now have an idea of where we want to go. And I think it makes sense. And I think it's going to be a competitive um, application to the federal government, both in the city, in the city and the county. And I'm excited about that. But we need to own it as a community. So we very much need that help. And I appreciate everybody's participation. Great. Marcy? Um, I would just I would say, you know, we are coming off of uh, the last year and a half or so of developing our long range plan. And one of the things that we've heard overwhelmingly from um, the, the region is that people want more transportation choices. And, you know, this is this is a great opportunity for people to let their voices be heard about how this particular expansion would um, would help them get around the region. Um, so just make sure you speak out um, and let us know what you think about these these projects. Right. Thank you. And and Sal, do you what is your what is your key takeaway um, to our audience on the future of this system and, and how it impacts residents and stakeholders in North City and North County? Sure. You know, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is a game changing opportunity uh, for members uh, of several communities who uh, have been through uh, periods of, of disinvestment. Uh, and so uh, continue to participate in these types of activities, continue to push for, for change and for the creation of opportunities, because this is great for everyone. Uh, at Employment Connection, we play a small role in helping to uplift the community. Uh, public transportation is obviously a major part of that, as I mentioned. So stay involved uh, and be a part uh, of changing the game for all parts, uh, for all members uh, of the region. Great. And, and just to reiterate, there is additional information on both the city and county portion of this project at 
growingmetrolink.com. Are there any other key takeaways, Kristen, Talby, Marcy, Ben, that you would like to leave with our audience today before we wrap this, this conversation this morning? I'll, I'll add one that I thought of while everyone else was talking. Um, just get out and ride transit. Ride the transit that we have today. Uh, build that ridership, even if it takes a little longer than you'd like, bring a book, um, because that's how we get the train, right, is that we demonstrate that we have ridership on the bus system, that we have ridership on the current Metrolink. Um, so yeah, get back out there and, and ride. So, so kind of to build off that, Kristen, just a little bit more, ridership on our current system is a critical metric for submitting for federal funding. And, and that's what you're trying to get at. And you know that's why we're asking people to jump on board all the time, whether it's for work or play. But could you talk a little bit more about that, you know, where our ridership is in comparison to other areas and, and you know, what does that look like? I mean, I, I, sure, I think all, a lot of systems have lost ridership post pandemic, um, but to the extent that our region can, can demonstrate that we're rebounding, um, you know, FTA is gonna start looking at post pandemic um, ridership trends in the, you know, going forward. So as we kind of prepare for that ratings in a couple of years and thinking about how to strategically be where we want to be as a region, just, you know, supporting the transit options that we have right now um, is, is part of what I do and what I hope others are, are advocating um, to build, you know, better transit options in the future. Thank you. Um, Talby, Marcy, any final takeaways for our audience this morning? Bobby, your hand is up. I see it. Yep. So uh, you know what? I think just to open ourselves to what is the possibility. These, these lines are possible. They make sense. We can get funding to, for them, but we need the unification of interest. And that unification of interest is in the simple things like riding transit, supporting transit, giving us critiques, criticisms. Um, hey, I, I, I want to see the stop here or there. I'm not saying that we can def we can do all of those things, but we're simply going to open our ears and try to create a system that's responsive. So let's think of the possible. I mean, it is possible to, re to recover those rides. As a matter of fact, um, look, Kristen made me look at ridership from, from 21 to 22. We're already back up 8% on Metrolink from the previous year. So we're slowly building back. We need to think of a new system that's responsive and has curb appeal where we can get those riders. We're going to do our best to do that. We're fighting every day for it. And part of that is looking at the ambition of the future. So that's what I'd ask everybody to do. Think of the future that you want to see in transit. Great. Not to mention that there are numerous career opportunities within Metro Transit right now, and that would also help us in the region increase frequency, which helps to build ridership, correct? That's right. We have great jobs here at Metro, <laughs> um, and I, I sure near, need um, frontline operators. These are great careers. Our average frontline operator has been with us between eight and nine years. And what does that tell you? It tells you that we invest in our frontline folks, they have great benefits. Hey, you can move St. Louis. Come join us. Great. Thank you. Marcy? I see we're almost, we're a little over time, so I won't say much. I'll just, again, reiterate that um, we know providing additional choices that are not just cars is important. We know that um, we have a lot of people who live in the region who don't have access to a vehicle and that it isn't just important, it's crucial to their livelihood. And so we are fully supportive of offering more choices and are just happy to be at the table and a part of this conversation. Great, thank you, Marcy. And um, I want to thank all of our panelists for joining us today. This is a really important conversation. We're having conversations about what service looks like today, about the quarterly service changes and how those are impacting riders. And, and we're talking about projects underway. Construction is happening in Illinois. We say, we're seeing, Illinois has seen a 21% increase in Metro bus ridership. And so ridership is coming back to the system. So 
looking to the future, this will be an important conversation for Citizens for Modern Transit, and we will continue to bring you updates as this move forward. But it's really important that everyone gets involved as well. GrowingMetrolink.com and consider getting back on the system, whether it's for work or play. I wanted to let you know that this conversation will be available later today. It's being recorded. It will be on our website as a resource for anyone who is interested in it. Um, and these efforts will continue to be ongoing. We have a lot of events coming up, including the opening of our transit transformation at the 5th and Missouri Station in East St. Louis later in July. And we will also have our upcoming CMT 39th annual meeting on September 15th. There's more information about that as well at cmt-stl.org. Thank you very much for joining us and make it a great day.